Welcome to University Place Presents. I'm Norman Gilliland. It was Winston Churchill who famously described Russia as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. And over the 75 years or so since the end of World War II, relations between the United States and Russia have certainly been mysterious, have been dangerous at times, on at least one occasion approaching nuclear war. We'll get some insight into what makes Russia tick and uh, what the future of relations with the United States might be from David McDonald, who is a professor of history at the UW-Madison. Welcome to University Place Presents. Hi, Norm. Thanks for having me. We're going to scamper through some three quarters of a century of Russian history, but I think even in this uh, flyby, we'll get some sense of the Russian point of view and the Russian background. I hope so. How it relates to us. So we'll start with this iconic image from the end of World War II, this I presume is Berlin and the, yep. uh, the Soviet uh, uh, meeting of the Allied forces at Berlin. Yeah, this is an iconic moment that symbolizes the end of World War II. These are Red Army soldiers uh, have scaled the uh, Reichstag and they've uh, raised the uh, hammer and sickle flag, uh, signifying the uh, surrender of the Third Reich and its destruction. That's still uh, celebrated as Victory Day in the in the uh, Russian Federation and by many uh, veterans throughout the uh, states in the former Soviet space. Uh, it was the climax. Was probably the crepuscular moment in the career of the Soviet Union. The one legitimately patriotic touchstone to which any Russian or m member of the, uh, many of the Soviet Socialist Republics, uh, uh, Ukrainians, Belarusians, uh, uh, Georgians, Armenians, uh, uh, Kazakhs, Uzbeks, on and on, could see themselves as having come together in a truly national or Soviet cause against what was recognized as evil. And uh, this moment by the 1960s becomes the touchstone for talking about a genuine Soviet patriotism. And of course, the war had come at great cost. Uh, uh, upwards of 30 million uh, uh, civilian and military casualties and deaths, the blockade of Leningrad, large tracts of the Western Soviet Union uh, occupied, uh, hundreds of thousands if not millions taken prisoner of war, some who uh, become D, uh, DPs, displaced persons, and move to uh, other points, don't return to the Soviet, others do. Uh, but it was a period of rupture, but of glory, and of, uh, as in other combatants, of, of incredibly rich lived experience and memory that different groups would mine for different lessons. Well, uh, perhaps a high point in relations between the United States and the Soviet Union, and we'll make the distinction, I guess, between the Soviet Union and Russia as, as we go along. Sure. But uh, 1945, uh, to use a term that's uh, way too uh, simple, but a feel-good moment for the Allies as well, uh, you know, whether it's Russians or English or French or Americans. Well, in retrospect, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, right? That uh, uh, sounds like a familiar phrase, but, uh, but uh, here we see uh, the successor to the so-called Big Three of Stalin, uh, Roosevelt, and Churchill. This is uh, uh, Attlee and Truman and Stalin and this meeting at Potsdam coming to a final agreement on the war. And if Yalta had been a, a, a celebration of triumph among the three uh, men who had led their respective states and empires through World War II, this you can already see the fault lines starting. And uh, there's uh, things about what Soviet interests are in Eastern Europe are starting to arise. Uh, and uh, it's right about the time that the, the bomb is dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so, uh, and the Soviets know about this. And uh, old suspicions that have uh, been put aside during the war but predate the war are already starting to take new shape. And we can see that uh, illustrated from the Soviet point of view or from, from international point of view. We get a couple of uh, shots of uh, that on the left is the Berlin airlift. A very familiar image yes, of that plane. Which is one of the first real confrontations between the former allies over the status of the Soviet occupied sections of Germany and in this case that strange jurisdictional island that Berlin was in the various sectors of occupation. They tried to blockade Berlin as a way of exerting diplomatic pressure and the Western Allies, but particularly the United States, had mobilized this airlift. And you can see people down below in what is still bombed out Berlin, 
awaiting their delivery. The next shot, again, shows us, uh, uh, to the right, shows us the, uh, the, uh, the growing assertion of Soviet interest in the new area that it had come to occupy after World War II. A former uh, Democratic Republic of Czechoslovakia, we start to see street demonstrations, in this case by communists, trying and ultimately succeeding uh, in pressuring uh, the Czech Czechoslovak government to become uh, what the uh, the uh, Soviets would call a fraternal state, ultimately a satellite. And then there's a domestic equivalent to this as well, as many people had thought the war within the Soviet Union, the war would bring uh, a lessening of the exactions of state authority that had so characterized the 1930s. Whether, really? Yeah. yeah they, Why? They, they thought that they had proven that this, the Soviet Union had proven itself, uh, that, that finally we would have the, the great enemy that had stalked them in the late 30s was now gone. Uh, to many, it appeared that cooperation and prosperity were around the corner. And of course, this is a period where we see not just the uh, growing uh, Cold War abroad, but an increasing or a new assertion of authority at home. And so uh, it starts off on the cultural front in, the, in 1946 with uh, uh, a set of initiatives by Andrei Shdanov, whom you see on the left. Of course, the figure who characterizes the period, Lavrenti Beria, or Beria, is the, uh, ch the head of the NKVD. One of the most notorious of all the Soviet uh, operatives. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, in many ways, and uh, a Georgian like Stalin. And uh, uh, we see uh, a series of concentrated episodes, most notoriously the doctor's plot in the early 50s, aimed at uh, a set of Jewish physicians who are uh, ominously charged with uh, having conspired to poison various leaders, uh, something that uh, ignites a certain amount of anxiety in the Jewish community in the Soviet Union, uh, a community that was very assimilated, had advanced well socially, uh, and that many others reacted to as the type of signal that had uh, 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 foretold the advent of the purges of the late 30s. And then also, uh, on the right, we see Trofim Lysenko, a, uh, a uh, agricultural scientist, who claimed uh, in contravention of anything that geneticists had known since the days of Gregor Mendel, he <laughs> claimed he'd found a way, uh, a truly socialist genetics, as a way to uh, increase grain production. Of course, agriculture was the chronic millstone around the neck of the Soviet economy. And his science, uh, because it was ideologically correct, uh, was used in it as a way to uh, Stalinize the upper ranks of the scientific establishment. Let's get a little bit into, uh, David, the psychology of, uh, let's say, the Russian leadership or maybe even Stalin at this point. We're talking about late 40s, early 50s. The goal, one of the goals, was to, what, establish behind this so-called Iron Curtain, yeah. another Churchill uh, term? Uh, yeah, 60, uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago right now, or 70 years ago right now. Yeah. And um, the idea was to establish buffer zones between Russia or the Soviet Union and, again, possible future threats from Western Europe? Or um, what was the point of it? I think that was part of it. I think part of it was uh, certainly with Germany, there was a, a fair measure of revenge that there's a scholarship from the last 15, 20 years that suggests, that demonstrates that uh, uh, the, the productive capacity of a lot of the Western Soviet Union had been absolutely annihilated by the Nazis, whether by occupation, by bombing or that they more or less pick up a lot of the physical plant of East German industry and move it to, uh, to sites in the, uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, a lot of it was security driven, a lot of it was, uh, not even buffers, was uh, an attempt to, uh, to uh, pursue the, the act of Sovietization of these areas. So it was still, uh, to some extent, it was an ideological... Uh, oh, there was always a very strong ideological... Internationalist yep. ideological move. Now, now, interestingly, not strong enough for some. Uh, I don't have anything on the Korean War up there, but uh, uh, the Korean War, uh, Stalin and his advisors at the outbreak come under big pressure from... Uh, the leader of the, the North Korean communists, but also from the new leader of the Ch People's Republic of China, Mao Zedong, who want him to uh, chastise the uh, arrogant imperialists uh, who are trying to uh, uh, kick the, uh, the communists out of North Korea, and Stalin refrains. But at the same time, we know that the Soviets have already, uh, through espionage, 
uh, cracked the secret of the atom bomb and are like uh, in, in closely behind uh, the United States. 1949, they yeah, have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and then the hydrogen bomb closely at, thereafter. So uh, there is an ideological component that, that reinforces uh, understandable security components based on this society, the, the, this political establishment, its last 25 years has been an experience of almost constant threat from outside from their point of view. An intervention during the Civil War, uh, the Allies trying to uh, support their opponents, then economic isolation, diplomatic isolation, uh, a lack of interest on the part of the Western Allies as Hitler was rising to, uh, to engage from, their, from the Soviet point of view, right. to engage them seriously. Uh, and, uh, and then during the war itself, a lack of a sense of trust, uh, a feeling of betrayal when it took the Allies so long to open up a Western front, and uh, deep suspicion, uh, some of it ideological, some of it political, of attempts to uh, 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 pervert or subvert uh, the, 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 the social and political and ideolo ideological realm that the Stalin generation had constructed since the 1930s. And voila, you have a Cold War. Uh, that's one of many reasons for it, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so speaking of Stalin, 1953... Not so good for Stalin. His, <laughs> his iron grip uh, relaxes, he, he dies. Yes. So, so far as we know of natural causes. Well, there is a Wisconsin strand of that. There, there are certain uh, uh, pathologists or medical historians who have, I've read, and I, I don't know, but uh, have suggested that somebody was feeding him warfarin. <laughs> uh, and uh, it applied uh -huh. because he was given to hemorrhagic strokes, apparently. Uh -huh. And uh, but yeah, here we see his body lying in state again. Uh, uh, what 1953, and this new conjuries like, what do you do after the old man's gone? This guy had dominated the lives of all those people you see, uh, and these are all the leaders looking on. As I recall, you can see Khrushchev and Malenkov. What's interesting is. Berea, Beria has been airbrushed out of the shot. He was at the funeral. He just disappeared, didn't well, he? Well, he's the first, by the summer of 53, he's been accused of, uh, uh, is, uh, he's hoist on his own petard. He is uh, accused of espionage for uh, hostile uh, hostile forces. And uh, yeah, and he disappears uh, discreetly, but demonstratively. <laughs> and there, there then appears to be this, of course, by now the Korean War is over. Yeah. But that had yep. been a confrontation in some, uh, limited ways, a direct confrontation between the United States and Soviet Union. Uh, you have combat pilots on both sides yes. participating. There, uh, the Soviets show more restraint than the Chinese or North Koreans would like. Uh, there is, I don't think this is primarily uh, strategically important to them. Uh, and looking ahead, that's one of the moments that historians trace uh, the, uh, what became the Sino-Soviet split of the 60s. They trace it to uh, uh, Soviets not being aggressive enough with right. the Americans yep. and the other yep. Western powers. Yep. Uh, there was a period of some then uh, instability in the leadership of the Soviet yes. Union, but at the same time they were engaging in what the U.S. would call uh, sort of international uh, adventurism in Hungary in 1956, for example. Hungary, East Germany in 1953, Hungary in 56, uh, then to, to a lesser extent Poland in 1956. These, uh, these uprisings, popular yeah. uprisings, yeah. Well, that they come in with military force to suppress. Exactly, and Hungary is very dramatic, and uh, uh, it, and for better or worse, it more or less coincides with the uh, Suez Crisis. That, uh, right. And so uh, it, it's, uh, it's a test of the accommodation. Of course, there are other factors, too. Uh, that there's, uh, uh, to West Hungary, there's Austria, which is under sort of a condominium, or had been until shortly before that. Yeah, I think 1955, uh, the Soviets yeah. finally pulled and, out. But Austria was forbidden from joining NATO or having any alliance uh, under the terms under which the, the Soviets evacuated. And the same applied to Finland. And so, oh, to Finland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finland, which had never, strictly been speaking, been part of the Soviet bloc, although part no, of no, it, I guess, it was, was but it annexed. Would, uh, there, there's, uh, when the Soviet Union ultimately broke up in the 90s, but at other times they'd, they'd talk about Finlandization, which you'd allow the people to uh, have the government that, uh, that they chose from our point of view, and, uh, but they, were, uh, they, they had to stay neutral. Uh, and Finland became actually a very interesting 
economic uh, filter for, for the Soviet economy. But, uh, but, and here we see Khrushchev, Nikita so Sergeyevich. And, and he becomes a, ultimately, uh, well, I guess you couldn't say the heir apparent to Stalin because their styles were so And there were different. so many. Like, uh, the, <laughs> he emerges at the top of the pile, uh, coming out of a period uh, that, that got euphemized in, the, in Pravda and the Soviet press as collective leadership, which they're, <laughs> they're really, I think, the last functional collective leadership had been in the mid to late 1920s. And even then, when we look back on it, it was because uh, just where this escalate, historical escalator bringing Stalin up or where Stalin was raising himself, was on, it, it only gave the illusion of collectiveness. But this, obviously, uh, you had... Uh, old old stalwarts like uh, Vyacheslav Molotov, who lives, lives, sees the collapse of Soviet power. Like he lives forever. Oh, you know, he like, lived into the uh, post. Yeah, yeah. Era. Old old iron pants, as they <laughs> call them. The American uh, diplomats call them. Sake of the famous cocktail. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, uh, Molotov, who, uh, uh, staunch loyalist. We know from a. Uh, 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 book of conversation interviews he did with the reporter, he was uh, more Stalinist than Stalin. He was, he was, uh, he was the ultimate Soviet ideologue, uh, the true believer, uh, very hardliner. Uh, Georgi Malenkov, uh, one of the big debates in Soviet policy uh, is sort of the guns or butter. Uh, debate. Sure. Do you, do you spend money on armaments or are we going to give the consumers a break? Because uh, uh, it had always been uh, expenditures on heavy industry, military technology, uh, building roads and the like. And uh, Malenkov uh, represented light industry, consumers, uh, the consumer uh, services. He was seen outside as generally more liberal. Uh, and then Nikolai Bulganin, who looked like a comer in the beginning, but uh, sort of fizzled. And then Nikita Sergeyevich Kudoshov, who, who uh, comes from very simple background in uh, Donetsk, an area that we know better than we'd like to right now, uh, the coal area in uh, eastern Ukraine, uh, had been had come up through the ranks via the uh, Ukrainian Communist Party and then is uh, brought to Moscow during the war. And after the war, emerges as a very folksy guy, but it's given the portfolio uh, in, say, a lot of governments, uh, if you want to disable somebody who you, whose ambition you fear, you give them a portfolio like uh, the Ministry of Finances, right? Because oh, sure. they, they're the, the ones way. that have to deliver all the tough news, right? <laughs> uh, and make the hard decisions. In Soviet practice, agriculture was the graveyard of uh, any sort of aspirations. Because it failed so often? It failed so often. It was, uh, it was under, it went under mechanized. There was a, very little in the way of distribution system. Uh, and Khrushchev came up with a plan. He was given agriculture. Let us plow all these quote unquote virgin lands on the Kazakh steppe, the northern part of what is presently the Republic of Kazakhstan. Now, the great thing with virgin soil, you know, it's like the sod busters on the uh, North American Great Plains. First time you bust that sod and put a crop in, it comes up gangbusters, right? But you have to keep replenishing it. And you have to keep replenishing it and tend it. Well, this is a really interesting experiment with it sees. Uh, the, the, the Soviet state send in thousands of student volunteers, volunteers in quote marks, uh, <laughs> but also uh, uh, non-criminal prisoners, like non-violent criminal prisoners. Uh, and they're supposed to, well, the thing with these virgin lands was they were also uh, grazing land for the indigenous uh, agriculturalists in the area who were shepherds, who were sheep farmers. and. So you get an awful lot of sort of ground level social conflict. Plus, Kazakhstan had been a place for deporting uh, nationalities that uh, were that Stalin was suspicious of, uh, suspected of treason during the war, especially German speakers from the Volga Basin, a lot of sure. Mennonites who were sent down there, uh, some Chechens from the Kaza, uh, from the Caucasus sent there, and <laughs> it's as if people had lost track of them. And you get all these new Russian and Ukrainian speaking people in this area. It turns into an extremely contentious uh, pro process, but the first three years, the bottom line, what are the yields? Fantastic. And then he's, Khrushchev is asked to give a speech as sort of one of the senior secretaries in the Communist Party, give a speech at the 20th Congress of the Commun Communist Party of the Soviet Union, February 1956. It's a secret speech that soon becomes just spectacular news because Khrushchev uses the occasion, it's supposed to be closed session, 
to denounce the crimes, quote unquote, of Comrade Stalin. Oh, the beginning of de-Stalinization. Uh, he talks about a cult of personality. He talks about the crimes against the loyal party leaders. There's actually very interesting themes because what he's done is they've still maintained this adulation of Stalin. Stalin's buried next to Lenin in the mausoleum right. at the Kremlin. Uh, they have towns, cities, villages, all, you know, from Stalingrad to Stalinor to Stalinets to Stalinabad, all sorts of settlements all over the, the, the Soviet space that are named after him. And Khrushchev is the first guy to uh, rip the mask off the man, but in a very interesting way. Uh, first, he does not question certain things Stalin did. Does not question, uh, does not question above all the collectivization of agriculture, which, as much as anything, uh, hamstrung uh, hamstrung Soviet agriculture productivity. Was that a fairly fundamental um, theory, though, of Marxist-Leninist? Uh, not uh, of Marxist, of Marxist-Leninist. Well, mm -hmm. a Marxist-Leninist-Stalinist thought, uh -huh. yeah. And <clears throat> you can look at collectivization as uh, trying to embody this uh, socialist or communist fantasy right, right. world. Uh, to other people, it looks like it was simply a way of taking care f once and for all of a famously intractable and by their light selfish peasant population. There's a great scene at the opening of Burnt by the Sun, uh, the, the, uh, the, the movie set in the uh, early 30s where you see uh, the Red Army doing military exercises and it, 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 a very powerful metaphor for what was happening in rural Russia at the time. So they were, what, just too individualistic, those uh, they just, farmers? They, well, they wanted, they wanted to do things their own way. They'd always been resistant to certain types of central authority and, uh, and the state refused to bargain with them in terms of letting them farm their crops and trade and that they were supposed to work like a factory. And, uh, and also, there were way more peasants and way more space than there were people effectively to administer them, right? And so it became a very draconian solution. Well, you couldn't touch that. That was a cornerstone of, uh, of the okay, Soviet so order. Khrushchev so Khrushchev is not going to condemn that. that. There's a whole bunch of things he doesn't touch. What he does say, however, and it, 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 people have buried in the back of their mind, Stalin downplayed the centrality of the party as the leading organ in the Soviet state. And it elevated the security services and all sorts of other forces. Uh, and uh, the party could not let this happen again because the party was the class vanguard and the conscious vanguard of the construction of socialism. So why did he dare to make this speech to the party in effect uh uh, condemning or downgrading the party? Knowing uh, as little as I do about the internal politics of the Communist Party, I think uh, a lot of it was that it was maneuvering for leverage in the contest with people like Molotov. And, the, and I think you were starting to get a generational succession, at least at uh, local levels, uh, who would have been delegates of the, at the uh, Congress. Uh, there were people, like a lot of, a lot of the people who were at that Congress, uh, quite a few of them might have been at the 18th Party Congress in 19, uh, uh, what would that be, not, in the late 30s, uh, or a few, but not very many, at the 17th Party Congress in 1934, that they had seen the purge, the purges sort of swathe through their predecessors. And one, one thing that seems to set in after 39, and definitely after 53, is the stakes for political failure are no longer going to be violent and humiliating death, right? <laughs> yes, uh, that's progress. It, well, <laughs> it is if you're one of the, <laughs> It uh, is if you're Khrushchev. But, anyway. but uh, well, let's, uh, it's worth noting that Khrushchev, as far as I can think, is uh, beyond abdications. When he is uh, shown the door in 64, he's the first leader, Soviet or imperial, who uh, actually walks off the job, right? Uh, uh, and. Um, and actually, it probably helps explain the tone of his memoirs. But so, Khrushchev. And we'll get to those memoirs yes. in a second, too, as we'll be talking about other uh, elements of dissidence. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so, on the one level, I think gives Khrushchev leverage with, uh, with, in this struggle with Molotov. And, and we know that to be the case because July 57, he strips Molotov and several others of these of their position in the Politburo in the anti party oh. scandal. Right, uh, the uh, dominant summer of '57, and then he, he seems pretty 
strong in the in his position because we see an amnesty for a lot of the people imprisoned under Stalin, people let a to lot go of out releases, of exile, yeah. and we see the onset of what they call the thaw, right? Which in cultural policy, there's uh, this interesting, fascinating window where uh, what had been a rigid censorship seems to come loose, and you've got, and it's not like people weren't writing things or, or, or saying things in private that were uh, against, you know, that were critical, maybe not against the regime, but critical of the regime. Uh, and we get this drama the dramatic publication of this fictional uh, day in the life of a prisoner in the Gulag. And this is uh, the kind day of the in the life. Kind opening salvo of uh, Solzhenitsyn. Yes, and it's the first appearance, the debut of Alexander Isaiah Solzhenitsyn, a uh, former math teacher, from the south of Russia, and uh, he'd been imprisoned towards the end of the, wor the World War for uh, saying vaguely critical things about Stalin. And he had uh, been an officer uh, during the yeah, war, and then, like officer, so yeah. many, arrested and just uh, yes, sent yeah. off. Except, like, um, uh, there were different types of arrests of the military. Like uh, people who had been POWs abroad, a lot of them were just bundled off to camp when they came back uh, uh, for fear. But, the claim was that they had betrayed the Soviet Union by allowing themselves to be captured. But others, they kept the uh, they kept the serving personnel under very very close scrutiny, and uh, and and Solzhenitsyn had uh, run afoul of that. Uh, but he gets amnesty. He writes this, and it's uh, it's a huge success. The where does he write it, and where is he when it comes out? Uh, he writes it. Uh, I think he writes it still. While he's in uh, well, he's in administrative exile, and I believe. I, I'm not sure, but I think he was likely in Moscow when he, uh, if he doesn't, if he's not Moscow when it comes out, he's in Moscow shortly thereafter. And, and the, he, he gets away with this, why? Because it's a condemnation of the gulag system under Stalin? Uh, I think the, there's, a, the, there's the feeling of arbitrary rule, of the tyranny of the mm -hmm. secret police, obviously of Stalin. Uh, and also, uh, one thing I think Khrushchev did, I, and. Khrushchev wasn't anti-Soviet or anti-communist, as we, as we, those of us who watched him in action well know, but uh, he had the faith in, uh, and it's a, it's a strain in Soviet and a lot of Russian or types of political philosophy or, or, or thought that there's a way that you can create proper citizens, citizens who are going to support the regime because they understand how this is for the common good, right? And, uh, but you had also to recognize the abuses that, in a way, you're setting off the Stalin period as one of exceptionally cruel and arbitrary rule. But one way of doing that was uh, giving critiques of it, because it wasn't of the present, it was of the past regime, right? Right. Uh, and, uh, but also this sense that, um, that this delayed, this loosening up that people expect after war, you're giving them that, but you're enlisting their support. You're making life better for them. And you're enlisting a creative intelligentsia on, on your side. Now, this, we know within the party, is already starting to raise some eyebrows. That there are sides drawn up in the party over how people receive different uh, things, over which editors they backed. Uh, but you're getting similar things going on in the national republics as well, especially in towns like Lviv or Lviv in Ukraine. Uh, people uh, speaking out. People not speaking out, but uh, more experimental art, more critical mm -hmm. of socialism. Uh, and But behind doors, starting to speak out, the beginnings of a legitimate underground. And a lot of the doors would have been... Uh, in <laughs> Pretty shabby. <laughs> well, not at the time. These brands making... These, these are, uh, they come to be called Khrushchevki or Khrushchevbe, which uh, is sort of the Russian word for Havel, uh, which <laughs> sounds very much like uh, the name, uh, the surname of Nikita Sergeyevich. Uh, <laughs> and the Soviet Union had industrialized dramatically during the, the 1930s, the uh, so-called five-year plans, right? right. Uh, and had never been able to maintain uh, a, a residential infrastructure, uh, uh, dwelling spaces, sufficient to absorb the huge influx of rural, uh, uh, rural Soviets who were dragged into Russia, into the Russian cities or in Soviet cities, to do this crash industrialization. And so, every, not everybody, but lots of overcrowding, lots of collective apartments, and that tough for morale. And Nikita Sergeyevich wants life to be better. This is going on all over Europe. If you go through London, Glasgow, Edinburgh, any uh, the 
they're done more elegantly. Big Scandinavian housing cities. projects. These huge housing projects, partly the baby boom. And one of the great technologies is prefab, right? <laughs> and so a lot of these are prefab, they're panels and that, but they're done under very different manufacturing and market auspices than they would be in, uh, in a place like Denmark or Scotland or uh, uh, in the housing estates. You think of the 50s and 16 era, 60s eras uh, housing estates in, in urban Great Britain or in places like Chicago, right, uh, or sure. New York or that. They have a, they're pretty good for about a decade and then they start again. And these Khrushchev, uh, they provide an, a temporary alleviation, but then they eventually become a symbol. A lot of these things become symbols of failure of just or the futility or the gym crack nature of uh, Soviet technology, even when they're putting people on the moon, or not in the moon, but in orbit. Let's remember Sputnik is what, 57? Gagarin yeah. goes aloft in 61. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're a viable competitor in the third world, the uh, Aswan Dam. Uh, uh, they, they put together the first non aligned nations uh, conference. Like the Soviet Union is a force, but Inside, it's coming at a certain domestic cost. They're better in space than they are on land. There's, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of evidence that would suggest that's not an unreasonable contention, yes. Now, uh, looking away from the domestic issues yes. for a minute, as we get into 1960, 62, 1960, it seems inevitable with this kind of softening of the Soviet stance that they're going to have even more trouble with the Chinese. There's going to be mm -hmm. this Sino-Soviet split. Yeah but also in international politics, missiles of October. Well, uh, let's start off with uh, Gary Powers, right? And, yeah, uh, 1962 also. Yeah, uh, 60, I think it is, because... Uh, 60, right. Uh, I've been in um, uh, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower and Khrushchev were supposed to have a summit. They'd met in Geneva in 56, and people are sort of sidling towards the idea of disarmament, uh, that already, you know, the French got the bomb now, and the British, and there's this feeling that this is getting out of hand, and, and uh, both, both national leaders uh, have their own reasons for wanting to pursue disarmament, or some form of what we'll later call detente, but uh, Powers gets caught in that U-2 over the Soviet Union. Shot down. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. and uh, and this is a huge international scandal. And, and then we get, what, the Cuban Revolution, and Fidel sort of vacillates. Again, historical retrospect makes it look like a much more certain process than it was. But it's also at a time of very complicated relations between the United States and all uh, the, the Caribbean and the, uh, the uh, South American uh, Yeah, sure, uh, countries. Was the, the big brother relationship is questioned by and, those. And at a time, after World War II, where France and Great Britain have undergone for uh, more, more gradually or less gradually and more or less violently have the undergone decolonization. this decolonization. And so even as you're trying to set up security in Europe, you're getting this ferment in the uh, South, and we get this crisis over uh, uh, the, the Soviets adopt Cuba. And there's Fidel and Nikita Sergeyevich down in the lower corner and uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And a graphic from, remember, the, the, the Soviets want to put missiles in Cuba. Sure. And Kennedy blockades the island. And we get this very tense stand -on. I remember growing up in Western Canada, uh, well away from the action, and people limbering up air raid sirens. Yeah. Uh, because our hometown was going to be on the path where the ICBMs were going to crack, we're going to collide. Between Havana and yeah, well, well, as the longer yeah, between range Moscow or between Siberia yeah. and Northern Russia. Oh, it was and, as tense yeah. as it got. Yeah. yeah, and and there was a genuine apprehension of war, the siege of the fallout shelter, and confrontation the, at sea. There, as, as Kennedy had put this so-called quarantine yes. naval blockade yep, yep, around yep, Cuba. Yep. And yep. Soviet ships with more missiles and missile parts approaching what's going to happen. Well, they, you know, we knew it was a, we knew it was dangerous because they kept interrupting Ed Sullivan <laughs> with bullets. You know it's dangerous when that yeah, happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and something real. Well, you know it's real, right? Uh, and so, uh, no, this is that's both look into the precipice and both. It actually inaugurates a, a brief but very interesting period of recon this reconciliation. Guy at Garden Limited, but. Uh, it shows, Khrushchev thinks it shows to his colleagues, who, whom he's put at terrible risk, the benefits of uh, a certain uh, policy. Soviets experience it, uh, and the leadership experiences it as a humiliation. And it is one of 
what becomes in certain circles a litany of harebrained schemes, quote unquote, that Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev has unleashed on the Soviet public. Can't uh, last much longer in leadership that well, way. No, no, and he, he uh, several initiatives he's tried to fa have failed. He tries several reorganizations of the party itself in order to ensure their loyalty, including splitting the party into industrial, technical wing, and agricultural wing. So agriculture. And what this does is it takes people out of what they would never say their comfort zone. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it disrupts a lot of old alliances and a lot of old connections. And it's obviously to Nikita Sergeyevich's benefit. Finally, a bunch of regional party executives, uh, uh, the uh, secretaries, first secretaries, they get together. And these are the guys that have propelled him to power in October 1964. They depose him. And we see another <laughs> kind interesting... Of, kind of a collective or a loose, oh, yeah, loosely yeah. knit collective of exactly, successors. Exactly. And well, we see right from the beginning a duumvirate uh, <laughs> of uh, Leonid uh, Brezhnev and Alexei Kosygin. Uh, Kosygin's a Petersburger light industry. There's hope, right? And one of the things Khrushchev had done about which there was still lingering dispute or he'd overseen was a set of economic reforms that promised to improve productivity, a way it was hard to build incentives into this system beyond simply realizing a sheer quantity, right? right. And you often a poorly measured quantity. There's a Soviet satire paper uh, called Crocodile, where they, and it, it was some pretty legitimate humor. They got one guy, they show you this pit and a crane pulling this huge spike out of the pit. And, you know, it's a casting pit. And the one guy says to the other, well, comrade, we fulfilled our quota for the year. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and so how do you build incentives? In? Well, even that, there were tensions within the party over that, uh, uh, not, not over uh, poor production, but how, how do you build in incentives without becoming capitalist? Right. And really, without jeopardizing the security of our jobs and our routines and the resources we control. So by the end of the 70s, early 80s, Kosygin has a moment of uh, glory towards the end of the Johnson presidency when he comes to Glassboro, New Jersey, and uh, there's a mini summit there, and in Washington meets with Johnson about issues. But Kosygin gradually moves to the margins, and we see the rise of Leonid Ilyich. Uh, another person from the same area as Khrushchev has the same very distinctive southern accent. Brezhnev. Uh, and, yep, and the accent these guys have, Gorbachev will have a version of it. It becomes the accent of power. Oh, right? the yeah. southern accent. Yeah, of authority, yeah. And uh, Brezhnev, most of us remember Brezhnev, remember, us in, remember him in his years of advancing f failure or senescence. He was very dynamic, vital, really loved life. He develops, it's funny that the best international relations that uh, Richard Nixon develops are with, uh, or Henry Kissinger, or with Leonid Brezhnev and with Mao Zedong, right? And Joe <laughs> yes, and Lai. that's right. And, yeah. uh, uh, but all of them who see the world in a certain way, who see politics as something brokered by great men in great situations. And, and uh, Brezhnev uh, presides over uh, an attempt to reassert uh, control. One poet refers to the generation he represents as little Stalins. These were the, what people call the class of 38, the people who had been the ultimate beneficiaries of the purchase that had vacated the upper reaches. And now it was their turn to rule. And uh, we see, uh, on one hand, a reassertion of party authority and orthodoxy, a definitive end to the thaw, which we'd already seen start under Khrushchev, but uh, a trial of Andrei Sinyaski and Yuli Daniel in a public trial uh, for a heter heterodox thought. Uh, we see uh, the, the threat posed by the Czech Spring in 68, and uh, there you see the streets of Prague uh, ho responding hostilely to uh, the Soviet tanks. There's even a small demonstration in Moscow. Hard to believe, Mayakovsky even in 68. Yeah, very brave. And then Solzhenitsyn becomes more prominent, and it's the rise to prominence of Andrei Sakharov and Yelena Bonner, his wife, who become sort of a safe haven for a lot of, we come to call them dissidents, it's a much more disparate movement than that. Uh, it's, it's its own, to use Solzhenitsyn's metaphor, it's its own archipelago of all these little isolated groups who meet, as the things would have it, at the table. They try and organize loosely, but uh, uh, they, they, the, the state tries to control that dissent. Uh, but at the same time, 
we get all this what they'd call informal action that doesn't criticize state but establishes realms outside the state's control because it's not in the state's interest. And ultimately, uh, one, you saw a picture of those kids sitting there. Uh, there develops an interesting black market that is generally tolerated as long as people obey certain rules. Uh, the, uh, the, the farm economy comes to rely as much as ever on the produce from 2% of the arable land in the Soviet Union that peasants are allowed to farm for their own profit. Free enterprise. And uh, bring, bring, uh, bring to market, yeah. You wouldn't uh, dare call it capitalism, but... Well, they just uh, call it the, uh, the, calculus, the collective, it's done by collective farmers. Uh, and so, as the Soviet Union moves out of the 70s, on the one hand, when you look at Brezhnev and summits, they have achieved what they've always wanted is parity. Right? You're starting to get these series of strategic arms reduction talks and the rest of it. Uh, but within, you're getting these very interesting accommodations. Brezhnev's rule is no, it, people talk about little stones, nowhere near. As a, nowhere, it doesn't come close to anything you would have seen under Stalinism. Or under it's very, repressive, you mean. And no, near, no, not near. Now, there are abuses, right? This is where we start to see the misapplication of psychiatric hospitals for imprisoning right. uh, the wrong thinkers. And we see the forceful expulsion from uh, the Soviet Union of people like, uh, uh, people like Solzhenitsyn. Uh, we see the beginning of third wave, so-called emigration, Jewish refuseniki, who, uh, because of the Soviet alliance with the Arab states following Israel. the Six Days War yeah, uh, against Israel, uh, uh, come, come under uh, suspicion and, per, and, uh, and pressure and persecution for being Jewish and talking about wanting to go to Israel. This is where we start to see this huge out-migration of a great deal of talent. And at the same time, uh, uh, a sort of concession of a certain sphere and uh, of different types of private enterprise, you will, to satisfy this growing consumer demand for a normal life, right? Um, and again, I'm not talking about the national republics at all, where each of them is going through their own version of these types of ferment, depending on what kind of diaspora they're in contact with abroad. Uh, and so we see by the, mid, by the 1980s, the Soviet Union has become a visibly necrotic state. <laughs> uh, that uh, Brezhnev re opening the Moscow Olympics, right? That everybody boycotts because of the invasion of Afghanistan, right, of which I don't have a uh, don't have a slide. But uh, there was a joke going around, and it's one of many Russians call them anecdotes of uh, uh, Brezhnev uh, reading the, uh, uh, the pronouncement, the proclamation, receiving the Olympic athletes and his comrades, uh, athletes. Oh, 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 and this aid, <laughs> yeah. this aid whispers Five in his circles. ear. Comrade Brezhnev, you just read the Olympic symbol. And, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then, who's he succeeded by? He's succeeded by Yuri Andropov. And we, uh, who's a, P, a Leningrader, uh, an intellectual, he's He'd got an advanced a degree. KGB. He was the head of the KGB. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, I remember I was a graduate student by that time. And the fevered speculation about what, well, he, may, he was pro-West because he liked whiskey, uh, <laughs> uh, scotch whiskey. Uh, he listened to jazz. Well, he was in poor health by the time he, he was the office. Well, they all were. The lifestyle. <laughs> uh -huh. um, a German physician released a, uh, a study of the sort of collective pathology of the Soviet leadership. These people were living on three, four hours of sleep a night under conditions of incredible stress. The selective process by which they rose, most of them having experienced indirectly or directly the 30s and the war, World War II, which demanded great things. They smoked like chimneys, they drank like 10 men, <laughs> and, uh, and they kept this going on the whole time. And the stress this took on them and the, the toll it took on them, like, Okay, Sakharov, uh, 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 Andropov makes it, what, six, eight months? And then you get Konstantin Chernyenka, who my Soviet friends would say, because he'd read speeches to party meetings, and he, they were convinced they were wheeling him out on a coat rack. Uh, he'd, al he'd already, by the time he comes to party, he'd already, he'd already obviously suffered uh, uh, neurological, or uh, neurological problems or strokes. Uh, he was barely intelligible when he wrote. It wasn't just his accent. It was just when he read. Uh, and he was the embodiment of the moribund nature of the state, this gerontocracy. And that slide that you saw previously of Edward Shevardnadze, Mikhail Gorbachev, and Yegor Ligachev, these were the three most visible 
of a rising generation of party secretaries, and we can talk about Gorbachev, but uh, Shevardnadze in Georgia, Ligachev, uh, the uh, Western Siberian right. Urals, uh, who had not experienced the war. They had received good educations at places like Moscow State University, regional universities in Tbilisi and the Urals, uh, had, were much more attuned to a, a different approach to productivity, who uh, uh, were, were uh, much more impressed with new technology. The way I would tell my students when I'm talking about this is, if you imagine May Day, watching Red Squ uh, standing on Lenin's tomb, watching the troops go by, and the tanks and the missiles and all the, uh, the hardware show that they always used to like to run, uh, Brezhnev and, and his guys were saying, boy, didn't we do something? And Gorbachev or Ligachev would say, what a mess, <laughs> right? And these guys, finally, Gromyka, Andrei Gromyka, the forever uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, he nominates Gorbachev to take over for Chernyanka in early 85. And seen here with Reagan. Yes. And Gorbachev comes to power. Uh, nobody knows anything about him. They used to, uh, people, a lot of people thought, oh, he was just a, a, a well-dressed, well-dressed, usual guy, normal Soviet, and uh, pretty clearly a an original thinker. Well, that became quite clear quite quickly. <laughs> uh, he started talking about new thinking. He started talking about uh, perestroika, right? Uh, the reconfiguration, restructuring, whatever. Um, one thing that was certain was a or one thing with two elements of which he was certain was. This was still going to be a socialist state, but it had to uh, had to involve society, and it had to uh, be under the leadership of a party that could control a development that would make the economy vital, and then make the Soviet Union vital internationally. And so this was going to mean a little bit of a breathing space internationally, which meant working on getting troops out of Afghanistan, uh, healing all the foreign things, and it's actually quite a traditional way uh, of balancing foreign and domestic needs. He frees up the private sector. We start to see him allow the formation of cooperatives. He calls Sakharov had been sent into exile in what is now Nizhny Novgorod, a place called Gorky. He gets come back. Andrei Sakharov, the, the yeah, dissident the, physicist. The, the physicist, the novelist, who, yeah. Uh, he, uh, uh, he encourages discussion of the so-called white spots in Soviet history. Uh, there, he encouraged the, develop, the, the election of Congress of People's Deputies. He talks a lot about change, but he also institutes a form of prohibition, the struggle against the green snake, uh, which is what they call, uh, <laughs> call alcoholism. I knew a, a, a tenant hotel says, trouble with these battles, green snake always wins. But uh, <laughs> uh, he, uh, he tries other things, other measures which are much less popular, and he also tries to reach out to intellectual society and to people who have always been pursuing their own lives sort of under the Soviet thing, but not engaging it directly, but, stay, but out of the way because they weren't doing anything offensive. He tries to mobilize their support. And he loses, well, part of what he's doing is he's trying to build a new system, you know, the old, this uh, cliche about building the plane while you're in flight. Right. Yeah, because he, the Central Committee, the sort of controlling body of the party, recognizes that he's a problem. And he's got to repopulate with his people uh, while, while he pursues his move. That's Chernobyl, uh, Chernobyl, but yes. his, his reaction to that, one of the things he does is tries to use that. He concedes greater autonomy to the national republics and their party section in exchange for their support in the Central Committee. But then this puts them in touch with populations and pressures, especially in the Baltic, in a place like Ukraine and the Caucasus, where uh, they have, they've always had their own agenda and now they're being allowed to pub pursue it publicly. Um, and so he finds himself increasingly isolated at a time when he's trying to assert power. And by spring of 1990, um, huge demonstrations all over in the National Republic capitals, but in Moscow, uh, these, yeah, the uh, Alexander Garden around the Kremlin, uh, just almost a million people out. And then this other demonstration on the right, it says, uh, uh, so today Lithuania, tomorrow Russia. And it's uh, when troops attack uh, the, uh, various uh, positions associated with Sayudis, uh, a, a movement of national renewal in Lithuania, and, uh, with analogs in Latvia and Estonia, 
uh, and troops are set loose on these people. It's scan pe uh, tens of people killed, big scandal. Uh, and Gorbachev, in response to these, has to go back to the people he knows because he's tried building alliances with social leaders but still believes in the primacy of the state and the party as the, the realistic directors and mobilizers and strategists for this. You don't concede authority to people who don't know how to use it. And of course, once these guys realize they're going to be junior partners, they say, Mikhail Sergeyevich, or Mishka, which is like saying Mikey, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they, 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 they turn on him. And he finds himself isolated by the spring of 91, especially when Yeltsin, uh, oh, Nemesis Yeltsin. haven't spoken, yeah. Boris Yeltsin, also one of this generation of young secretaries, also a dynamic and, and, and relatively free thinker, but very outspoken and confronts Gorbachev and the, that group publicly for not moving fast enough, gets himself thrown out of the Politburo for his pains. Another iconic photograph, though, of Yeltsin, uh, you know, facing the tank. Well, absolutely. Well, he's elected president. Finally, these characters on the left, the, the uh, Extraordinary Committee for, uh, the, for the Emergency, Gorbachev, as you'll remember, in the summer of 91, is resting in the Crimea, has won the Nobel Prize, why not, uh, Peace Prize. And all of a sudden on TV in late August, and I remember it was my third year here, they show up on TV. And they, they announced, well, we're going to have sort of the equivalent of martial law. Uh, at the same time, as Soviet TV is showing this backdrop of images of demonstrations and that um, new technology that these guys don't think about, faxes and rudimentary messages on the wire are pouring out of Soviet, Soviet, uh, 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 Soviet phone lines telling people what's happening. And people all, all from all over Russia gather in their various places, Palace Square in Petersburg, uh, Red Square or by the White House, and we see this dramatic showdown where Yeltsin is standing on this tank, uh, tank belonging to divisions that have come out in support uh, against the uh, against the coup plotters, the the putsch guy, putschists, and within three days it's all gone. They had tried a, a, a traditional assertion of authority, and it had been to use a Polish term like a knife in the water. <laughs> and Christmas Day, we see the hammer and sickle come down from over the Kremlin to be replaced by the Russian tricolor. And it's the beginning of the Yeltsin era. And an era that <clears throat> is still a subject of huge controversy among Russians. Liberals will say this was a time of real possibility. Right. We could have we could have built a liberal democracy. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, but uh, others say this is a period of Russia's ultimate degradation and humiliation. If you want to compare it with anyone, anything, it's like uh, 1916, 1917, or the time of troubles at the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, we were humiliated abroad, at home. Soviet socialism didn't work and planned economy didn't work. Let's privatize. The way they privatize, it worked well for small economies like Poland and Czechoslovakia. Small economies with the infrastructures dating to market economy, it led to absolute ruin and catastrophe in Russia. Uh, we see the emergence of the generation of oligarchs yes. who, uh, who more or less are people who know how to adapt the best to, the, uh, to these new conditions. Phenomenal uh, entrepreneurialism. Uh, yeah, in sort of a combination, and Russians of the time use it, Wild West and Robber Baron. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, th there's no law. Uh, the old security and law enforcement apparatus are totally gone totally gone. Corruption, that that we know flourished. Well, the way to think of the 90s was it ripped the lid off a system that was already rotting inside, right? Uh, and you saw visibly, and if you're a Soviet citizen, or a Russian citizen by this time, you saw palpably on your news things that you'd always suspected were going on, but now you blame it on the, uh, on the new order, right? And this, um, this new order or new... Uh Degradation or new disintegration, depending upon oh, the has point a of view. Huge foreign component. As a, it's an existential thing, right? Uh, if in 1985 I knew where my kids were going to school, I had savings in the bank, I was going to go to the sanatorium for my holiday down the Crimea or whatever. By 1990, and, and when I looked on TV, Soviet athletes, Soviet musicians, artists, where they were dominant, right? Whatever the problems of the system were, 
I was still in a serious country. By 1995, I needed a passport to get to a sanatorium in Crimea I can't, can't afford. Uh, I don't know where a kid's going to school. The school's not open. They're, they can't pay the teachers. I, my savings all got evaporated by inflation. Uh, I was given some shares to some kind, but I knew nothing about it. I sold them, and then I realized, no, I saw it in the paper. Oh, so-and-so was amalgamating this built Triple M. Uh, and then abroad, the way Yugoslavia melted down, an area the Soviet citizens felt was theirs, NATO just pushed them aside. NATO itself expands. NATO encroachment. Well, from the point of view of a lot of Soviets, uh, a, uh, when they uh, allowed Germany to reunite in 1989, it was apparently on a promise. I don't know if it was or so, but people remember it as this, that George Bush said it wouldn't come at the cost of re-securitization of East Europe, that it would, they would honor Soviet, old traditional Soviet spheres of interest. Uh, this happens down in, uh, in Yugoslavia, and NATO encroaches. And there's no, your Olympic teams are lousy, uh, you got no, no money for anything, and it's this Yeltsin guy. And look at him, and he, he's got, beyond his booze problem, he's got tremendous circulatory problems. He runs for president in 1996. Uh, the cardiologist said he had something like 12% flow capacity. <laughs> he, he, was, he knew he was risking his life to do it, right? And, uh, and the opposite, but people were still committed enough that they would not vote communist. The communists developed the Communist Party under Gennady Zuganov. Wanted to stay that course. Yeah. They would voters would use instead this guy like Vladimir Zhirinovsky, sort of a wild-eyed uh, uh, nationalist who spoke in the most extremist language. Uh, uh, that was their prod, their goad against this uh, their, to protest the power. Well, and, 1999. Then we start to see this guy. Well, it's funny too because uh, this guy, uh, <laughs> who we see uh, probably in late 1999, before he assumes the the role of temporary president, Yeltsin actually resigns the presidency, right? Um, but this guy, when he first came, he was just one of a succession, a rapid succession of prime ministers from 1997 on. Uh, 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 Boris Nemtsov, uh, Kasyanov, uh, there's a whole bunch of them uh, who, uh, for some reason or another, fall afoul of what are new established interests, oligarchs, uh, new productive sectors or the like, or maybe Yeltsin's entourage doesn't like him. It's very unclear what's governing, what's driving succession, but Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin who had been the protege of Yeltsin's counterpart in, in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, uh, 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 a guy named Anatoly Subchak, law student from Petersburg, uh, but had been in the KGB, had been uh, counterintelligence in East Germany. There is a British scholar who's theorized that the trauma of watching uh, Die Wende, the, the, the transformation in East Germany and the collapse of the wall, uh, sort of resolved Putin never allow something like that to happen in, Soviet, in Russia. And, uh, but he takes over in 1999 with a speech that says, we're going to make this a better country, and we're going to do it in ways that respect our traditions, but also incorporate democracy, because that's what we want. And, uh, and our traditions are, the state is the necessary guide to this. And uh, he has, uh, we've seen that he's turned out some ways that we didn't expect, in other ways that we were worried about. And um, that is still an un unfolding story, I'm afraid. David McDonald, thank you for sprinting through some of the last 75 years of Soviet slash Russian history with us. Well, it's a great Soviet performance enhancing drugs. They helped me do it. But thank you. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm Norman Gilliland, and I hope you'll join me next time around for University Place Presents. <laughs>